Shalom, Shalom everybody. I'm Yuval Avivi, together with uh, Maya Sela, I host the daily literary show Undercover at Kantorbut uh, radio station in uh, Israel. I'm very happy to open here a series of uh, meeting with Israeli writers at the National Library of Israel as part of the celebrations of the Hebrew Book Month. Um, let me just say first that uh, we will have time for questions from the audience. So if you wish um, uh, to ask something, please write it in the chat box and uh, we will try to answer it later. If it's relevant to the course of the conversation, maybe we can, uh, we can try to answer it uh, uh, in the conversation. I'm very happy to start this series with one of Israel's most successful and most loved writers one of my personal favorites, uh, Dror Mishani, Shalom Dror. Hi, Yuval. Very nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, uh, Dror Mishani is a best-selling crime writer. Uh, he's a screenwriter and he's an expert in the history of crime fiction. We'll talk about all of this uh, this evening. He's also the head of creating writing program in the literature department at the Tel Aviv University. Uh, uh, Ani's novels uh, include The Missing File, A Possibility of Violence, and The Men Who Wanted to Know Everything, which are all part of Avram Avram series. And I understand there's one coming up uh, soon, right? Another one. It came out in uh, Hebrew last year, and uh, it already came out in German. Um, a few months ago, and in English in the summer, in August. And another one which is not uh, a part of this, uh, of this series is uh, Three, which is a great, great uh, novel, a thriller, and it was also translated to English, and uh, your novels were translated to uh, more than 20 languages, and they also uh, won numerous inter international prestigious prizes. So we're very happy to have you here to talk about Israeli literature and about your Israeli literature and about a lot of other things. Um, maybe uh, uh, some of the people who are here with us don't know that you were not meant to be a writer. You were meant to be a scholar, right? You were supposed to be, uh, uh, to have your PhD in literature and you were on your route to do so, and then you stopped and you started writing uh, uh, literature. What made you switch lanes? What made you uh, quit the, the academic work and, um, and begin writing yourself? First, let me correct you and tell you that, you know, I was meant to be a football player. This is what <laughs> I was really meant to be, but, you know, since this didn't, you know, work out, I, um, <laughs> I was, yeah, I was, you know, I always wanted to, to be a writer. I always wrote. Um, and in fact, I, you know, I started publishing short stories when I was in my twenties, but it's true that um, for a long while, I, I, you know, I wasn't successful I, in writing a novel. I, I tried and I, and I couldn't make it. And instead I did other things like teaching and editing and translating and also uh, being a scholar um, of Hebrew literature and then of you know what interested me at, at one point became the detective fiction and it's true that I left P that my PhD there were many reasons one is that um, you know a topic that we like to discuss you and I Val, is that my children were born and I don't know it, it changed something in me I felt like you know this is you know they say in, in sports this is the money time you know really I you know what I do now is my children will read it one day um, what do I really want to leave behind uh, what do I really want to leave for them and I understood that it's you know it's literature it's novels it's stories it's not a PhD and also I was a bit tired with the, um, the need to justify every sentence I wrote, you know? When you, we had the chance to talk about it a few weeks ago, you know, when you write um, a dissertation, you always need to be in the realm of truth. Every sentence you say need to be truthful. Um, 
And I was tired of saying only the truth as if I'm in court all the time. And I wanted to invent um, and I wanted to lie. And um, yeah, so this is, this is why I left the PhD. Draw, we're, we're asked if it's possible to make the microphone a little bit closer to your mouth. Yeah, sure. I hope it's okay now. Thank Fantastic. Um, so it's interesting that you're saying that um, that you're saying that the children were the thing that made you uh, do this change because a lot of your books are dealing with being a parent and being and, and having kids. And it's not always optimistic. You're saying that your kids uh, will read these novels one day. This is the, your legacy. This is what you inherit them. Uh, uh, this is what you give them. And um, and 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 maybe um, maybe they will find some uncomfortable truth about parenthood and the way you saw it when you write uh, when you write these stories because. Um, a lot of the kid, a lot of the kids in your novels are sometimes abandoned. Sometimes things happen to their mothers, to their fathers. Sometimes, sometimes their mothers and their fathers do things to them. It's very complicated. Yuval, you just go around the thing. Children <laughs> are murdered <laughs> in my books, and, and sometimes, and sometimes in real life. Um, yeah, you're right. I don't know what was I thinking. Um, when I thought, you know, this is what I want my children to read. Uh, and in fact, my children are now, you know, getting closer to the age of, you know, this, when the danger becomes, um, it's really dangerous. They might read my books one day or another soon. Um, I think that, you know, what they'll discover in, in, in them is, is, you know, my truth, the stories that I have to tell, things that I went through as a child and as a parent. And yes, like you say, some of it is not very optimistic, not very, you know, beautiful. Um, but I think they know me, you know, they know all my dark sides. Um, so I'm not sure they'll be very much surprised. And that I'm sad to say that, you know, I, I my children are not reading so you know, they're not reading a lot, so maybe they won't read my novels. Maybe it will change uh, later in life. Yes, uh, maybe. You're optimistic. I'm always optimistic about reading. I'm sure with, uh, with, uh, with so many books behind you, they will be persuaded at some point, for sure. So yes. why, why did you choose uh, writing uh, detective novels and, um, and thrillers? You know, I'm sure it's like this maybe around the world, but um, in Israel, it was considered, maybe still considered, not the most prestigious uh, uh, line of writing. It's not uh, the, the writing that uh, used to get, to get you in the, this, uh, this uh, literary club. This, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was considered as a, as a minor or marginal writing uh this is this is a genre that's not so um well accepted in israel why did you choose it um so i think partly because of that um you know i there's a, a line from um from a, a wonderful writer that i like to quote um it's the pioneer of detective fiction in in israeli literature um Batyagu. and so she wrote she and Shulamit Lapid, uh, another, they were the first to write uh, um, detective novels in the late 80s. And I saw a documentary uh, about her in which she was um, interviewed. And she was asked, it was very interesting because she was interviewed while doing the dishes. Can you imagine, um, you know, male writers male being writer, interviewed no. while doing the dishes? Yeah. So Batya Gu was interviewed while doing the dishes, and she said, uh, they asked her, why did you start writing detective fiction? And she said, I wanted to start, I wanted to write my novel. And then I thought, what, well, can I write the big Israeli novel like Amos Oz or like David Grossman? No, so I'll write, and she said in Hebrew, it's Rak Roman Balashi, so just a detective novel. 
And there's something about this that is familiar to me that I, and you know, I understood it immediately. This, yeah, you know what, I'll be modest or, you know, maybe it's fake modest, but I'll, you know, I won't say that I'm, I'm writing a big Israeli novel. I'm, just, I'm writing just a detective novel. But in fact, maybe I will try to do something else, like, you know, in, 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 in a way that is like um, subtextual or something like that. So it's like, also, choosing, like choosing like a, a, a minor uh, genre uh, yeah. in order to say something uh, major. Yeah, but, but, it's, but it was also, at the same time, it was also my way to belong and not belong. Uh, something that, you know, I feel strongly, you know, and it has a lot of, you know, I feel it and I, 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 I think I'm, you know, I, I belong and I don't belong in many ways to the like mainstream Israeli literature. And this was a way to state it, to say, you know, I'm here, but I'm not really here. I'm, I'm also there. Uh, I belong, I, I do feel like I belong to this, you know, tradition of modern Hebrew literature, but at the same time, I don't fully belong. And I also belong to this wonderful tradition of, you know, the, the global tradition of, of detective fiction. And also, you know, look, I, I just, this was the genre that I was obsessed with as a reader, um, you know, the, the detective fiction, since it was created in the 19th century, there are many, many writers who started as really almost fetishistic readers of, of the genre, um, including the greatest writers, you know, like Borges or uh, Ricardo Piglia, you know, really, you know, amazing writers who were not just detective fiction writers and really started off as, as uh, avid readers of the genre. And this is what I was. And I was, uh, you mentioned that I was writing a PhD. I was writing my PhD about the history of um, uh, crime fiction. I was also an editor at the time in a publishing house, in a big uh, publishing house in Israel, Keter. And I was doing, I was trying, um, I was not translating, I was editing the translations of classics in the genre, like Dashiell Hammett, and Henning Mankell, um, and I, at one point, I, I just, you know, told myself, this is what I want to do. I want to write this genre, this narrative form, this character um, in Hebrew, uh, in the streets of the city where I was born, Holon. Uh, I, I don't want to be just a reader. And in fact, there was, um, you know, my, my, my first novel, The Missing File, I was very lucky. And it was read by an, a writer, a great writer who passed away since Henning Mankell, one of the greatest um, writers of the genre in, in the 20th century. And, and he wrote a beautiful sentence about my novel, a, sen a sentence that I'll, you know, I'll always cherish, not just because it's a compliment, but because it was really the essence of what I was aiming at. He said, uh, my detective's name is Avram, Avram Avram. A double Avram, and he, and he wrote something like uh, Avram is a wonderful addition to the stage on which detectives from around the world dance together. So this image of you know detectives from all around the world, men and women from the 19th century, the 20th century, and the 21st century, dancing together, uh, and Avram dancing with them shyly. Is, uh, is, a, is an image that I, I take with me and that I, in a way, I, you know, I, I aimed at. Do, do you feel that the literary scene, the literary uh, audience in, in, in Israel are less uh, accepting of the genre than other places? It's, it's more difficult to be a thriller writer in Israel than in other places because we don't have the tradition. Or yeah. as you said, maybe it's connected to the fact Maybe, it, maybe it's it's a question. What was first? But because um, you you told us that uh, that the, the this this genre in Israel is uh, is not a it's not a male club. It's not a men club like in other places in the world. It's actually the back door in which uh, you mentioned two women. At the back door in which these women came inside the literary world of Israel. So 
do you feel it's more difficult that the views uh, of this genre are more critical in Israel than in other places? Yeah, for sure. It's not just the, it's not just the critical view because this is maybe less important, but it's, um, it's the readership. Uh, we have uh, the readership of, of detective fiction is not as large in Israel as it is in other places. Um, it, it, it's partly gendered this thing because in, in other uh, literary cultures, uh, women read detective and crime fiction, thrillers, and in Israel it's considered, it's still considered to be more like a male genre um, and, and female readers are really skeptic about, you know, reading detective and crime fiction. Again, it changes a bit, but it's, it's, it's still there. And for example, you, you mentioned that my, one of my last novels, three, that is not a detective novel, but it's still a thriller. And, you know, we, we designed the cover of the book. It has to do also with the way the novel is structured. The novel is not really structured like a thriller from the beginning. But also the, the, the cover design was, was not, it didn't disclose the fact that it was a thriller. I remember that I told my publisher, Sarai Gutman, I told her, listen, let's put, you know, like in, in big letters, thriller on the cover. And she said, no, let's not. Do that. And in fact, you know, it was my book that sold, you know, the most in Israel. And I had many, many readers, mainly fe female readers who, who came to me and said, listen, we never read detective fiction, we never read thrillers, but we didn't know. So we started this one and then we were tempted and then, you know, we were in already. And now we might try your you yeah. know, more classically detective novels. And, and also, you know, but in, in it's, you know, it's really, really, it's a problem. I mean, I, I was just, um, you know, I was just in, um, in, um, in Greece, because my book was published there. And, um, and I, I saw the, you know, the shelf of, uh, of detective novels there in translation. It's amazing. It's amazing what they have. We have none of that. And also, um, I mean, you know, there are no literary prizes for crime fiction. There, it's in many, many ways, it's a, it's a problem. Um, we are asked uh, at the, uh, from the audience, what is the difference uh, about uh, your stories in contrast to the writers that you mentioned, like uh, Mankel and, and, and other writers from the world? What, what's the difference between yours and theirs? Um, so, in, in fact, my novels, when, you know, when I started writing uh, my novels, The Missing File, I, you know, I wrote 10 years ago or a bit more, like, almost 11 years ago now. What I, what I was thinking is, how do I merge this tradition of Hebrew literature, modern Hebrew literature that I, again, I, I do feel that in a way I belong to it, certainly as a reader, and, and the genre of you know, detective fiction. How do I create a mixture of those? And Avram, I would say, is the illegal son of these you know, two traditions coming together um, in the sense that you know, he's not really Hebrew literature because he's a detective and you know, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's from the side. And he's not a detective like you know, most of the detectives that we know, certainly, certainly not like the you know, classic detectives, you know, Poirot um, style. He's, he's closer to some of the, you know, more modern European detectives, but still, I think he's more of an anti-hero than them. And this has to do with the fact that he belongs to Israeli fiction. And uh, so he's in a way, you know, of course I exaggerate, but you know, if Yosef Chaim Brenner, uh, you know, one of the greatest Hebrew writers, if he one day tried to write a detective novel, I'm sure it would have become, you know, much better than my detective novels, but it's something of the sort. But well, this is this is the the, the anti-hero of the uh, who is really central in the Hebrew literature in the turn of the 
the century of the people that uh, that came here at the turn of the century and didn't fit in and were forced to leave their homeland and came here and it was really rough. And then we, we read about them throughout uh, the years. And, and now you're saying that um, this anti-hero of the, the, the one person that didn't fit in the Zionist, the Zionist uh, uh, um, climate or the Zionist group, he's Avram Avram. He's the, he's the, Avram Avram is their son. Yeah, he's he's related to them. I wouldn't say that he's them, and I'm not sure he's even their son. Like I said, maybe an illegal son, um, <laughs> maybe a nephew, um, but he's definitely has some of their DNA. Sure. I, I want in 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 in, uh, in your novel. Your novels are very very local. They're very Israeli. There, like you said, um, but other than uh, not only that they belong in this global uh, detective uh, tradition, they're also very global. And the fact is that uh, it was very, uh, it was easy to translate them and to make, uh, we'll talk about it maybe later, and uh, make them uh, uh, in, into movies or, or, or TV shows. And there was something very, very local, very Israeli about it. it was and you even chose Cholon, which is not the big Israeli city. You could have uh, chosen uh, Tel Aviv or Jerusalem to be more uh, more familiar for the for the for the readers from outside of Israel. But you chose Cholon, which is not very familiar to the to these uh, these readers. And still, you made it very global. You still made it something that anyone in the world can relate to. How did you do it? Well, I have to tell you something. I'll, I, there's a, um, I'll say a sentence that, you know, for a while I thought was original, and then I'll tell you something about it. But it's true what I'm going to say. When, uh, when my uh, book, when the, the Missing File, my first novel was uh, first published in in America, my American editor in HarperCollins, Claire Wachtel, told me, listen, you know what I like about your book? And uh, I said, what? And she said that it can take place at the same time in Israel and in China. And I swear to you that when I wrote it and before I, before I you know, gave it to my first readers, I was sure that not just people outside of Israel won't understand it, but people outside of Cholon won't really <laughs> understand what the book is about. And I thought for a while, I thought that this, parad you know, this paradox is something that has to do with me or with my fiction. But then I swear to you, I heard at least two Israeli writers saying the same sentence or telling the same story. And it's not like we, you know, we have an, like a reservoir of uh, stories to tell. Um, I think it's something that's built in into, you know, global literature or, or the state of global literature now that, you know, some books, not all of them, are at the same time local and universal and, and we know it. And it's, it's true for detective fiction you know, maybe, maybe it's even truer for detective fiction because detective fiction on the one hand deals with, you know, the most, at least the, the one that I like to read and, and write with the most tragic stories. So in fact, you know, the stories that I tell in my novels, you go back to the Bible and you go back to Greek mythology and you go back and these are the stories that I tell, you know, stories about, like you said, fathers and sons and mothers and daughters and siblings and the violence within the family. And um, so this is completely universal, but at the same time, you know, this the setting of this specific crime that I tell is, you know, for me, it's again, like I said, very, very particular to Holon, and in fact, this was one of my motivations when I when I started writing, to write about the city where I you know grew up and where I was born and grew up and and about you know people that I know as friends and family and that I thought you know they weren't protagonists of Israeli fiction enough. Um, it was like considered that you know they were 
I don't know, maybe not interesting enough, maybe not literary enough. And I thought, no, I mean, their stories are as, you know, dramatic, sometimes tragic as stories that take place in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem. And in a way, they're as Israeli. They're not less Israeli than stories that take place in the kibbutz. In a way, they're much more Israeli than we know. But maybe in the difference uh, is not that big between the people in Tel Aviv and the people in the kibbutz and the people in, the, in Cholon. Uh, the same way that it's not very different from people in Stockholm or in uh, New York. Because what's, what's great about your books is that you find out um, pretty soon in your novels that the mystery, that the crime, that solving of the crime is sometimes not your main goal even. Because what you deal with is a lot of times the, um, the psychology or the dynamics inside the family, which is something that everybody can relate to maybe. And, um, and sometimes you even end the, 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 the investigation at uh, page 200, while the book continues to page uh, 300 and, and 400. So I mean, the, the... I've never wrote 400. I, I always <laughs> end at 280, Yuval. It's... Uh... <laughs> I can't, you know, it's too much for hundred. But we, for me we, as a writer. we discover, we discover that the, the killer is caught and and yeah. sentenced uh, as sometimes in uh, page two hundred. But then you have eighty pages more to talk about what happened to the people after he was caught. It's not only about the mystery. It's not only about the investigation. It's not only about who done it. It's not only about uh, getting the right guy um, behind bars. It's, it's, it's something else. No, you're right. I mean, I, I again, you know, we talk, we're talking about traditions. I belong to the tradition. I would say it's a more European tradition of the detective novel that it's not a whodunit. I mean, the whodunit is an aspect of it. Sometimes I use the whodunit question in order to attract Sometimes, you know, for, for, for parts of the book, like you said, but not, you know, along the book. But I, you know, want to tell a story, you know, I use the detective story in order to tell, in order to investigate other things. Less, not really a society. I don't feel that my novels are, you know, it was, the detective novel was used as a means to investigate societies like Hanning Mankell's novels, you know, we mentioned. I feel that in my novels, you know, the, 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 the detective form, like this narrative structure is a way to investigate the soul, to investigate, you know, metaphysical questions. And so the whodunit is not the only question and sometimes not the most important one, um, you're right. So let's talk a little bit about translation because the whole, the, the, the thing is that being local and being global and writing about Israel as, as a global place and writing a detective or thriller as a global theme uh, is, is something that led, led you to other places. You just been to Greece, you said. Was it yes. the first time uh, that you were translated to, to Greece? Yes, uh, three. Um, my... Uh, my own, like the one before the last uh, was translated now to Greek. It was the first novel uh, translated to Greek, but now they're already translating The Missing File, my first book. And I met uh, a wonderful publisher there, a small independent publisher with lots of passion for books, exactly like the one that we like and uh, that we know from Israel. We have in Israel, you know, independent publishers like that. And, um, and it was great. It was really wonderful. So you meet the readers there in Greece. Yes. And, and, and this is obviously something completely different than being in your hometown, being in Israel, meeting the people that you, you, you actually already know. And this is something new. How is it to, to, to find a totally new crowd? And how, how was it uh, accepted there? How, what was the, the uh, reaction there uh, at the, with, the, with the Greek audience? Listen, it's a whole different conversation uh, about the novel in, you know, in Israel and outside of Israel. And again, it depends in which, in which country. It, it, it's different in the, in the US, it's different in Germany, and it, it's very different in, in, in some of the European countries like France, Italy, Spain. I mean, in Israel, it's not just that I know the people, 
you know, the, the novel is read differently. It's read through different, you know, I would say sometimes sociological questions regarding, I don't know, Mizrahim and Ashkenazi, so Sephardim and Ashkenazim, Oriental and, I don't know, Occidental Jews. Uh, it, it, it's read sometimes through questions of the language. Um, it's most of the time I find that it's not really read as a detective novel. It's read as a novel sometimes because critics don't really know what to do with it as a detective novel. So they read it. And, and I like this reading too, because, you know, it's a serious reading that takes the book very seriously and sees sometimes you know, beautiful things in it, but in, this is in, the lack, the lack of the lack of ability of us, the writers, in, 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 the, the, in the a way. that we can't deal with it if it's uh, if it's detective, if it's a thriller. We have to say, well, okay, so this is we have to judge it with our tools. We force your books into our. You you don't force. You just you like I said. If it's if my books are a mixture of two traditions, you see one of them, you know, clearly. And the other, maybe less so. For example, in my last novel that was uh, that is going to be published in English under the name Conviction, in Hebrew it's Emuna. Um, you know, there were two very important writers for me uh, while writing it, and they were, you know, they're in the novel in many many ways. One is a, a Swiss no uh, novelist Friedrich Dürrenmatt, and the other is a Sicilian writer Leonardo Shasha. They're both, you know, writers of many genres, uh, but they were amazing crime writers or detective writers. And their, their detective novels haven't been translated and very few people in Israel know them. And so, you know, when, when most of the Israeli readers read these books and they see quotes from Leonardo Shasha, there are quotes from Shasha in the novels, you know, they read it, but it's not as important for them like, you know, for readers of the novel in Italy or in Germany or in France. And so I would say that if, you know, when we talked about this mixture or this merge uh, of two traditions in, in Greece, for example, you know, most of the conversation is really about detectives and what they do and how they do what they do and why are they interesting when they're interesting. And and in Israel, but it's it's fine. I mean, it's not it's it's almost natural. I would say, you know, Yuval, that in your own cultural context, you read in a certain way, and then outside, you read in a different way. So. Is, doesn't it make you feel a little bit alone in your hometown uh, that uh, that we don't share the same, or maybe a very small group of readers? share the same background, share the same tradition in Israel. And you have to go outside to other places to find people that really know what you're doing. We are trying to do it with our tradition. With uh, We don't really know how to uh, to read you in both ways. And you have to go and uh, look for other audiences. No, because, you know, you know, let me be personal for a second. You know, the way you read my novels uh, as novels about parents and children, nobody read them like that outside of Israel because they were read only as detective novels and you read them in a different context of Israeli literature and the way it writes about parenthood or about manhood. So, you know, for, for me, you know, your readings of the novel were not, you know, were as moving, if not to say even more moving than, you know, than, than read, you know, uh, readings of it outside. So, no, I don't feel alone. You know, like you said, there are more and more um, interest. There's, you know, in, in, in detective fiction, it comes with television and cinema too. We have more translations now. Um, it's true that what they're translating now is mostly current stuff and not enough classics. And they don't go to the, you know, the great backlist of, of detective fiction. Um, but, but I, you know, when I feel lonely, I just take a plane. I go to Athens. I go to Germany, and I go to, and I feel yeah. Fine. You also, <clears throat> uh, you were also translated to um, to uh, Swedish, uh, Swedish, uh, and um, and this is like the the crime novel uh, mecca, right? The crime novel. Uh, 
um, main uh, main place, and um, you were really uh, accepted there. You you received a huge award there. What does it make you feel that in a place that values so much this kind of writing, uh, treat your uh, writing like this? Yes. First, let me say that uh, Mecca of the of crime fiction for me, at least a personal Mecca, and I think that it's not really only a personal Mecca, is, is Paris and, and French. And what I was very, you know, I discovered, you know, like I said, there are not a, a, lo a lot of uh, crime fiction translation in Hebrew. So in fact, truly, I discovered the genre in my 20s when I lived in, in, in Paris. And when I, and most of the, what is interesting for me is that most of the, um, you know, the, the global tradition of detective fiction, even the one written in English or in Swedish, I first, you know, discovered in French. And for me, these, uh, you know, the Serie Noire, uh, there's a, like a black, the black series of uh, Gallimard publishing house. This was like the Mecca. And when my, uh, my, my previous novel, um, Brie, that was called in French, Un, Deux, Trois, One, Two, Three, um, was published in, in the Serie Noire, and it was my first in the Serie Noire, I was, uh, before I was published by a different publisher. Uh, so this was like the most moving thing that I could think of. Being published in the same series that, you know, published 80 years ago, um, Chester Hines and Ross McDonald and Patricia Highsmith and all that. Um, Sweden was very, very important just because the, the award, this specific award is called the Martin Beck Award. And, the, and Martin Beck is probably my favorite detective or was at the time of, of uh, writing The Missing File. Martin Beck is, uh, is the, um, the detective written by a uh, husband and a wife, uh, Mai Shioval and Per Valu in the 60s. He's probably the most innovative uh, detective in the history of crime fiction, you know, when he was written. And they were the first to, they were in fact the godparents of, of uh, Scandinavian crime. They were the first that understood that, that, you know, this form, literary form can be used in order to write serious social novels, but their novels are also so funny. And, uh, and I was, I, I wasn't, I didn't translate, but I edited the translation of their first novel, Hosanna, uh, to Hebrew a few years before I received the prize. So being awarded with Martin Beck was, uh, was really something. Does it change you as an Israeli writer to be translated? You go around, you meet other audiences, uh, you meet, uh, maybe you discover more uh, the more of this uh, literature you talk to other publishers uh, you meet translators uh, this the whole yeah. procedure is probably something that's must change you maybe yeah uh, and you know that um a lot of times we we'll, maybe we'll talk about it uh, a little bit later the israeli literature scene is in a very it's not in a very good place there the readership is it, there are fewer and fewer readers uh not so much money and we always feel like we are on the verge of of completely losing the israeli literature maybe it's not so but that's what, what we always fear and it, it became very common that writers in israel have to pay in order uh, to have their books uh, published in Israel, which is very uncommon in other places in the world. So we, sometimes people say that Israeli writers now, when they write, they aim for the global market because we can't survive only with the Israeli market. And this is only one change, right? This is only the, the, the um, commercial change. But also you discover other methods of editing, other methods of writing, uh, other audiences. What are the, the, the ways in which it changes you as a writer? Yeah, so first I'll say that I was, um, you know, I'm not ashamed. On the contrary, I'm, I'm proud to say that I aimed uh, at the you know, global market from, from my first novel. And this was exactly because I understood that you know, my readers are partly here, you know, readers, like you that uh, you know are reading uh, my novels through the lens of uh, modern Israeli fiction, but that my readers are also abroad, and that this is the 
the game that I wanted to play, this is the field that I, like, you know, like Mankel said, this is the, the, the stage where I wanted to dance in. And, um, and I, I, I don't think it affects my novel in any way in, in terms of the texture or the, you know, the locality or language, you know, language, maybe we'll talk language later. Um, I think that what this contact, this contact with other writers and other publishing scenes is um, inspiring. Many, many times it's inspiring. I mean, I remember, you know, the uh, three, the, so this novel three, um, the idea for this novel came to me while I was on the plane back from uh, Lyon, where the, the, the most, the best uh, crime fiction festival in Europe takes place. It's called Quai de Polar. And I was just going on the plane after, after three or four days, you know, conversations, public and private conversations with great crime writers. And I went on the plane and I had an idea for a new novel. Um, and it's because it's stimulating and it's because, and, and like you say, you, and, and, and it's also, it makes you sometimes um, critical of our scene in Israel. Like you say, you know, when you see publishers uh, around the world struggling because, you know, I think that in most countries that I know, publishers struggle, you know, they have the same problems with, you know, from Netflix to Amazon to whatever. And, um, and they still struggle because they're passionate and they're still publishing books. And of course, the our market, you know, is significantly smaller and it's a problem for our publishers. But it's, you know, so it's stimulating. And I'm, I'm you know, COVID, uh, two years where, you know, there were no festivals and there were, this was a really, really depressing time for writers. Not, to, not, for, not only for literature, I mean, it, it's interesting because some of the people I, I've talked to saying that it was a good time for literature in the sense that people maybe read more books, but for writers, it was a depressing time in the sense, at least for me, that, you know, it's true that I had more time for myself, which is always important for writers, but I, this stimulating contacts were missing. And now that, you know, the world is open again and festivals are on, I'm saying yes to every invitation. And in fact, I'm saying too much. <laughs> I, I don't have the time to write. And I started a new book and it's a problem, but, you know, um, I'll find a balance soon. Where is the best audience for uh, detective novels? Who are the most, uh, uh, wh where are the most excited uh, audience regarding uh, uh, detective uh, novels and uh, thrillers who, in the world? Listen, it's so difficult to say because for example, you know, like I said, it, France for me is a very special arena for my books because of, you know, my personal connections. And also because France was one of the first literary cultures that gave the detective very, very important place. And um, so, so France, but Germany is, um, you know, the readings, when I go to reading tours, um, I find talking to the German audience very, very interesting because Germans, I think, read my books, at least, again, from two angles. One is the detective fiction angle, and the other is they are more interested in Israeli fiction than I think other places, maybe for historical reasons, I don't know. Um, Spain is a very, very interesting place to, to read in because they have their own excellent and very unique tradition of, um, of detective fiction. The Latin American and Spanish crime fiction is very different than others. And so they have their lens and they have a certain respect for uh, detective fiction that comes from the fact that most, most of their you know, great writers um, I'm talking now about Latin America, you know, from Borges to Bolaño, uh, through uh, Antonio Muñoz Molina, you know, they were, they all played with the genre. And so they have a lot of respect to playful um, detective novels. And so it's very difficult to say. Um, Let's talk a little bit about uh, TV about um, about um, maybe this genre is more it's, it's more easy uh, um, 
to make a, a TV series out of it. And it's also something that um, more and more people want to do in the world and, um, and in Israel also. They want to they wanna have their, their, uh, um, their book um, adapted to a series of a TV series or a movie. Was it something that you thought would happen when you started writing them? Did you think that's the route you're going to? Uh, you're no, going not at all. And in fact, you know, unlike with, my, with the translations, this is something that I never worked for. I, you know, it just happens. Um, you know, I really, you know, I, when, when I wrote The Missing File, I, you know, I, I, I worked myself on the first version of the Indian translation in order to make it available for foreign publishers. This is how it was sold. And, but on, on the contrary, you know, with, with television, when I get emails from television producers, you know, usually I, I don't even answer them unless I see it's a very serious, um, you know, producer. Um, so it just, uh, it happened. Um, my first novel, The Missing File, was adapted into a French film uh, by a French director that I admired before he made the film. Afterwards, uh, I still admire his previous films. The, this film, I'm not sure. Uh, it was done into, it was adapted into an Israeli TV series that I like very much. And now it's, um, it's going to be an American television series that is very interesting because it's unique. You know, in the Israeli television adaptation, you know, my detective is Avram Avram and it's Holon and this is how they did it. And when, when it was adapted into a French feature film, so Holon, you know, changed into Paris um, and the detective was not Avram Avram, but Francois Visconti. And, uh, but now when it's going to be in the US, they did something that is, again, an interesting mixture because my detective Avram, he, you know, he keeps his name. He's still Avram Avram, but he's now in the NYPD. He's an American Jewish detective. Um, and I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm very curious to see it. I, you know, it's being shot now. And the writer is David E. Kelly, who's, you know, he did wonderful adaptations for books and you know great series. And the director is Barry Levinson, and I'm very very eager to see what you know what they did with that one. So in a way, when 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 your your book is adapted to a TV series or to a movie, they allow themselves to change more than they would uh, in, in, when translating uh, the book. When they when trans when they did translated your books. They never changed. Correct me if I'm wrong. They they don't change the name of the of the of the characters. They don't change the scene. It's it's still in Holon. Uh, they don't change the the scenery. And then when they adapt it to uh, to TV, why is it that the audience needs need need, uh, needs these uh, changes? I don't it? think I'm not sure they need it. First, you know, television they have the power. They can do whatever they. I mean, you know, they buy a book and then they can turn the protagonist into something completely different and, and you're, you don't have a lot to say in it. And, and also, you know, I think with my books, you know, my books, you know, they, they sell well, but they're not Harry Potter bestsellers, right? So it's not like they're going to, not. yes, so they're not going to put, you know, based on uh, the missing file, and then millions are going to to watch it. So they're doing whatever they need in order to adapt this into an American, to a good American detective show. And and also, you know, don't forget that they're they have so many constraints. I mean, they can't. For example, my novels, in terms of plot, they're quite slim. I mean, they're not. You know, I you know I I delve into characters and psychological relationships. But in terms of plot, they're not so elaborate. And so, you know, maybe they can hold three, four episodes in a TV in show, sense. in a TV season. And, yeah. uh, and, you know, they don't do three or four episodes. They do eight. Yeah. So they have to come up with new plots and subplots and characters and... Uh, and it's fine, you know. This is the this is 
material. And what I really want is that, you know, good films or good television shows will come out of them, but they don't have to resemble my books. They really don't have to resemble my books. I prefer that, you know, whoever is interested in my books would just read my books. Um, you're, you're also a screenwriter and you consult uh, TV production houses in Israel. Maybe we could, you can uh, you can think about the reason why I th- mean again, correct me if I'm wrong because you know more about it than I do. Uh, that the TV the, the Israeli TV is also very successful uh, right now in, in around the world. And um, like Israeli books maybe or more than Israeli books and um, there is a lot of interest in the world in the t- in the Israeli television. Why is that you think? I, I don't know for sure, but you know, maybe I'll speculate and this speculation has to do with, with books and with the book market in a way. You know, I, when I was a, an editor um, 15 years ago, I was in a, in a book fair. I, maybe it was in Frankfurt, I don't remember. And the, you know, everybody talked then again, 15 years ago about Scandinavian crime fiction. You remember the time? Um, so, and the question that everybody asked themselves is why is Scandinavian crime fiction so good? And, um, and then I met a Scandinavian publisher, I think it was Swedish, and he told me, listen, the, the explanation is very simple. Uh, Stieg Larsson was so successful that many other writers who wouldn't write crime fiction necessarily before that, you know, they were right, just other kinds of novels, they said, let's try it too. So you had a lot of talent pouring into crime fiction. Maybe this is something that happens in Israeli television now that, you know, like you say, people, it's so difficult to make money out of books. It's so difficult to make feature films nowadays. You know, five years ago, it was easier, but now it's very difficult to make feature films in Israel. So a lot of the talent that would have gone to books that would have gone to cinema is pouring into television and maybe this is part of it. So let's, uh, let's uh, I, I want to, uh, to give the audience a chance to, uh, to ask their question. What, what, I know it's a big subject, but you mentioned it now. What do you think about the Israeli uh, market, literary market? Maybe we, we feel uh, always that it's, uh, like I said before, it's uh, uh, on the verge of collapsing because we have very few readers and uh, we know that uh, we don't, uh, we, we feel like, um, like you said, there's not a lot of money in it. And somehow in, I don't know how, we write a lot of books. There are many, many books published in Hebrew and Israelis, it seems want to uh, to write and don't really want to read. What do you think will happen in the next few years uh, in Israel? Something must change, I think. I really don't know. you know I think that you know the problems are so deep in a way, and they have to do, you know, and they range from you know the way our uh, children are taught at school how to read and the way they're taught literature at school and the aversion they develop to books in a way. And it has to do with, uh, with our bookshops. And you know, the fact that you know, what I learned um, you know, in, in touring different countries is that uh, the most important mediator between the book industry and readers are bookshops. And the bookshops, you know, in most countries that I know, they're as intimate like the like a grocery used to be like I don't know 50 years ago and you know there are many many places it's very you know it's very it's like it's the case in in France in Paris at least it's the case in Germany you have your own local bookshop and you trust what the bookseller tells you she tells you listen you know I read this book you you have to read it and in Israel the whole mediating system of the bookshops we know it's it's very complicated now it's almost collapsed and there are no independent bookshops anymore. And, um, and so it's, and also maybe it also has to do with the book that we translate. I mean, maybe if we translated, you know, I have 
like you said, I'm I'm uh, doing creative writing in in Tel Aviv. Um, I see very young students, you know, the the aspiring writers, but also our readers, you know, the the ones who really read, and you know, they they read a lot in English because they read fantasy novels and they read sci-fi, and there's not a lot of sci-fi and fantasy in translation. Maybe the book industry needs to understand something that has to do with that. Maybe, maybe it's maybe we're in a time where things do shift and change in a way. But I, I really don't know. I really don't know. I I, I feel that you know. I, I'll say something very optimistic. Okay. Yes. Until, of until but I swear to you, that it's a true story. Uh, I can bring her, and she'll she'll you know vouch for me. Until four days ago, I had a non-reading daughter. She's twelve years old. She was like, I, I don't want to read, I'm not reading. And then she discovered a book that is called in Hebrew, Tichon Laila, uh, Night High School or something. It's, translate, it's translated from, from English. I think it's a British series. And she read four books in the series in three days. Really? Yes. And, wow. uh, and so now I, from, from having a non-reader uh, as for a daughter, I now have a bookworm. Uh, for a daughter <laughs> in three days so things can change um and i think they if they can change on a personal level like that they can also change on a, on a more public level um at least that. i'm very happy to be optimistic about it so uh things will change for the for the best uh, soon i hope let's uh let's give the audience a chance to ask you a few questions um let me see. Um, Yolanda Naor asks, how are your books received in Germany? Well, you touched it a little bit, but maybe you can uh, elaborate. Uh, how was the experience in Germany? Um, I can say that they, you know, they were very well received in Germany. And in fact, um, Germany is the place where my books sell the most, probably, at least, at least uh, like the, the last two novels. And Drei, uh, three was a very big bestseller in Germany. It, it's partly because I have a wonderful publisher in Germany, uh, Diogenes, he's a Swiss publisher based in Zurich. And really the model for a publishing house that maybe we should have, you know, adapt some of their, you know, it's, on the one hand, it's independent and very selective, but it's, you know, it's always, he has like a 60 or 70 years old tradition and they publish, you know, the, the greatest, uh, living writers, um, you know, Nobel Prize winners, and at the same time, they have this very selective list of crime fiction, so they're not, and it's in the same, it's in, they, they don't have different series, it's in the same collection, no, you know, discriminations, um, and they invest so much in, in, um, in bookshops, and in the relationships between, you know, before Drei 3 was published, they, uh, they brought me to Germany to, and they did a huge meeting um, with 500 booksellers from all around Germany in which I introduced the novel and talked about it and did an interview like this. And this was like three months before the novel was, was published. And, and it was really to introduce this novel to, and maybe this is something that we should do more. So Germany is, it's very it's great. Sounds, sounds amazing. The, right? the, really, it, amazing. It, it, well, we have to say the truth. It, it costs money, you know, to, to bring 500 booksellers from, but never mind. Okay. Yes. I wanted to say something, but I won't say. Okay. okay. Um, uh, Joseph Galron asks us, uh, asks you, uh, how much are you involved in the translation of your books uh, to foreign languages? Um, What's the relationship with uh, with the translator? Hello, Joseph. Uh, Joseph is doing the Hebrew lexicon. Um, um, so, yes, um, it, it really I'm involved only in English and French, the two languages that I can read. I sometimes, you know, I do answer questions from translators in other languages, but the two languages that I do read, like the manuscript. Are English and French, but it's to say, to be honest, I have two 
amazing translators, Jessica Cohen to English and Laurent Sandrovich to French. And I told both of them, and I'm, I'm really not exaggerating that my books are better written in English and French than they are in Hebrew. And uh, it's, and also as you know, I, I translated some things and one of the texts that I translated to Hebrew, I translated The Death of the Author by Roland Bar. So I'm not dead yet, but I, I acknowledge the fact that for the translator, I can be dead. And uh, you know the text will speak for itself. And um, yeah, you know I have we you know with Jessica and Lawrence I have great wonderful funny discussions about tiny details. For example, you know with Lawrence with the French translations we always go into these debates about clothes because first because Avram is not a very good you know he's not a very good dresser. He doesn't have a, an amazing wardrobe. And also because the Hebrew language is a very slim language, is a very economical. And so I always write, for example, you know, when people, you know, when, when they have to wear something, usually I like to make it, but you know, when they have to wear something, I write chulza, which is, I don't know, a shirt. And then we go into elaborate discussions about in, in France, you know, in French they have many words from for different shirts and so Laurence goes so what kind of a shirt he's wearing and I'm like I don't know what kind of shirt he's wearing goes, is it with buttons is it with a collar is it with and I I, I really don't know I haven't thought about it. it's not um, enough we think about these things yes, we just put on a shirt and go outside exactly <laughs> That's wonderful. But but um, do uh, translators uh, from other countries, from other uh, languages, other than English and, um, and French, interact with you? Do they do they uh, send you emails with questions and uh, asking you questions about the Israeli culture? Do you have to explain things? No? Very rarely. Uh, I'm in constant, um, because uh, Markus Lemke, my German translator, translated all my novels. And he, he already works, he's already translating the novels more or less while I write them or just when I finish. So I am in touch with him. Um, but other, it's very rare, you know? I, I don't know why. I'm very accessible. Yes, you are very, you are very accessible. Uh, Mishani, I want to thank you so much for being here tonight. It was thank wonderful you, to talk to you. Uh, and I want to thank all the audience uh, that came here. Uh, you had great que questions and it was wonderful to be here with you. And, and again, thank you for the National Library of Israel uh, for uh, giving us the opportunity to do this series. Mishani, again, Thank you so much for, uh, you, for uh, to me. Thank you tonight. all for coming. Thank you very much.